Thanks, everyone. That is a, that is a good segue. So um, as Harriet said, I'm going to be talking about um, combining existing theoretical perspectives with new ways of working on social. Um, one thing I just wanted to highlight at the beginning was, as we all know, this industry does move very quickly. And we had to provide our presentations for pause a few weeks ago. And since then, there's already been some major developments in social, one of which was announced yesterday with Facebook making yet another misstep uh, around the reporting of their metrics, which really um, begs the question around validity of all of their, their metrics. So uh, if I was writing this presentation last night, I might have framed a couple of points a little bit differently here today, but I think most of it is still really relevant. The other thing is I talk a lot about sort of large global brands um, within this presentation, but what I'm talking about is really relevant for any brand or, or any company. Uh, so I think one of the um, one of the unintended consequences uh, of the rise of, of the internet is this tendency towards oversimplification. So we scan for the headline, or we take refuge in channels like Facebook, where it's all about self-reinforcing algorithms that echo our own opinions, or um, enable a kind of collective outrage. So people tend to take very oppositional views um, extremely extremely quickly. So this environment tends to breed overly polemic and controversial style debate um, that's not always, not always that helpful. Um, and I think in our industry that debate really manifests primarily as the old traditional versus digital. Uh, and I know this has been a topic that's been touched on today. So the TV is dead mantra or the, the social media is a waste of time, uh, traditional advertising just doesn't work anymore, all that kind of stuff. And I think we, we love um, we love a headline, we get high on hyperbole and we get very attracted to these very polarising headlines. Um, but unfortunately things like this, are, they're just not that helpful. Um, it's a very illogical kind of, kind of argument and it encourages a kind of closed binary thinking um, and disregards really what we know um, and what's the knowledge that's been accumulated over you know, quite a number of years in marketing and also can easily dismiss the potential opportunities that, that digital provides. So I think we need to be borrowing the best from both worlds. So if we want to be genuinely successful in social, we have to make, pay more attention to the laws of marketing and behavioural science, uh, and also lean more on the responsive, agile kind of ways of working that digital really not only enables, but also demands. I think there's a huge amount of BS that goes on um, when we're talking about digital marketing. And I think some of that can be quite readily debunked with marketing theory. So things like prioritising engagement over reach in social channels, um, not including any branding on online video because people won't find it authentic or um, you know, consumers won't, won't watch it. You know, that kind of stuff really does fly in the face of a lot of what we know about brands and how to market successfully. That said, um, it's starting to feel like 2017 might be the year where our industry becomes a little bit more critical and challenging when it comes to um, some of this debate and that people can actually um, you know, ask questions around the efficacy and effectiveness of digital without fear of being branded you know, a Luddite uh, or a traditionalist. You know, what we really need to do is be just critically evaluating all of our approaches, our media channels, and then selecting you know, the, the, the right approach and really recognising that digital marketing can be really um, readily improved by incorporating some very sort of um, theoretical perspectives around marketing. And at the same time, you know, applying digital modes of, of production and ways of working to social just doesn't work. You know, we have clients that come to us who are working with bigger companies who are used to maybe producing um, advertising or bigger pieces of work and they find it very frustrating because, you know, it operates on a different time scale. Um, you know, it doesn't require the same agility that, that, it, that working in social uh, and digital content does. So I think this approach is really simply su uh, summed up as, you know, brands need to be more adaptive. It's, it's almost the Darwinian perspective of um, it's not the strongest of species that survives, it's not the most intelligent, but it's the one that's most adaptable to change. So when we think about how this um, might come to life in social, what does it actually mean to be adaptive in social? There's, there's a number of different ways we can think about it, but for today I've focused on four key principles. Build salience at speed, customise content for the channel, borrow traditional media thinking, and, and be responsive. Now, people are exposed to around 30,000 messages every day. So there are literally hundreds of thousands of brands and companies all vying for your attention. We need to do everything we can in social to actually build memorability, or what Byron Sharp 
um, called salience, which is actually the ability of your brand to be recalled in the moment that matters. So not just in an artificial research context, but in an actual moment of decision making or a, an actual buying situation. Um, and I think in digital media, you know, it's incredibly hard to get people's attention. We've got to do this, but we've got to do it at speed. And you know, that, that's not always easy. But I think there's two primary ways that we can approach it. The first is by producing work that's really creative and is designed to generate an emotional impact, whether that's humour or empathy or whatever it might be. It doesn't necessarily mean dramatising everything, but you know, many of the world's most successful brands um, have really created value uh, and, and really sort of built the foundation of their brand you know, on emotion and creativity. And many years and many research studies later, creativity is still the most proven way, not the only way, but the most proven way to build uh, profitable brands with long-term term futures that, that sell more stuff. But gaining attention, even with this kind of work, even with work that's really emotive and impactful and really engaging, it, it's, you know, it's still hard. You know, Snapchat ads average a three-second view. People expect w web pages to load almost instantaneously. Facebook users only spend an average of 1.7 seconds with content on mobile. So it's really hard to get people to spend time with us. It's, it's not easy to convince them. And particularly on social where people are you know, swiping and, and scrolling and, and moving through things extremely quickly. Don't despair though, because the good news is that people can actually synthesize information incredibly quickly. So our brains are capable of processing information at great speed and it's only getting faster. So recent research um, has shown the, oh, sorry, my slides kind of jumped there, but shown the human brain can actually process um, an image in as little as 13 milliseconds. So that's, that's a, um, a move up from the 100 milliseconds identified in previous studies. So pretty amazing when you think about it. And it also means that when audiences are scrolling past um, your content or communication in a feed, um, it actually gives you a little bit of confidence that even if they see it for only a second, if we create the right impact um, with our content, and if our brand is recognisable, we can still actually have an impact. Uh, to add further to this, it's worth thinking about or looking at how our brains actually perceive and process information. So if you're familiar with behavioural economist Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, then you'll know uh, his term of system one thinking, which is actually um, the part of our brain that processes sort of most of our decisions. So about 80% of our decisions use system one thinking. And essentially, system one thinking is really rapid, intuitive, fast decision making that really doesn't involve any thinking at all. Hence the, the, the autopilot reference. Now that's in contrast to system two thinking, uh, which is really a part of our brain that we employ when we need to engage in conscious reasoning. So it's much slower, it's got limited capacity, um, and it's, not, it's a, a part of the brain that we use less frequently. And it's effectively the pilot. So if you think of system one as the autopilot and system two as the pilot. Um, now most advertising messages, most advertising messages are actually perceived by the autopilot, by system one, which is actually responsible. So everything you perceive through your senses, whether it's you know, visual or touch or smell, that all travels through auto, the autopilot system. So that's processing every bit of information at a huge speed of uh, 11 million bits per second. So it's super fast. Um, and what that means is we actually need to, be, we need to talk quickly. We actually need to deliver our messages in, in seconds more often than not. Um, but the good thing uh, that's worth thinking about is that, as I said earlier, even if we don't necessarily have somebody's attention for a long time in social, we can still have an impact. Um, so we don't necessarily have to have someone's conscious attention. You know, if we, as I said, if we can create a recognisable piece of communication for our brand that only takes a second for someone to notice, then what we can do is build or reinforce, re refresh the memory structures that actually link back to our brand and they give us a much better chance of being remembered you know, later on or down the track. So some practical things to do um, to be remembered on, on social. I think one of the most important things is, is to actually focus on um, what Byron Sharp calls distinctive assets. And this is when the kind of, you know, the good old fashioned marketing science actually becomes quite useful. And what he means by this is, uh, visual branding assets that are, or well, not necessarily visual, but branding assets that are unique to our brand. So when someone sees the logo or the colour, the packaging or a combination of some of these types of things, they immediately know that it's our brand. 
So the easier, um, you know, as I said, we can make it for someone to recognise it, it's the easier it is for them to remember us. Um, and a few sort of tips on, on, again, what to do and how to be remembered. You know, creating customised content for the channel is getting more and more important. So you don't always have to do it, but there are some you know, great opportunities by using um, a functionality that's native to the platform and really understanding the way content's being consumed across different channels that can help Im increase your impact. Don't be shy about your distinctive assets because even if you make a really great piece of content that's super engaging and very entertaining or really useful for somebody, if they don't actually link it back to your brand, then you're just another post or piece of filler content that's floating by in their feed. So um, I know the kind of, I don't know, the purest digital folk might not, might not like to hear that, but I think it's actually really important, especially in a channel like Facebook. Um, use video, although after yesterday's announcement, I'm, I'm taking that with a grain of salt. But we do know there is a general trend, obviously, towards video streams growing, um, and it's been a big driver in terms of um, social take up on mobile. We know that, for example, with Facebook, video and live streaming is elevated in the feed, so you're given preferential treatment. And, you know, obviously, video is a great way to have an impact. You know, that combination of moving vision and, and sound when you can get it, um, you know, it, it, it can really kind of um, yeah, make, make an impact. Hook people in fast, don't waste time. Uh, I think that's a mistake that, that people make. And we've certainly learned a lot about that, particularly in the last 12 months. Make sure some element of your distinctive assets are in the first three seconds, because um, you, know, you may lose people after that and you've basically wasted the moment you've had with them. Aim for at least 10 seconds retention. So. Facebook and Nielsen did some research um, and they basically came to the conclusion that um, three seconds was enough for someone to actually be able to recall a brand, which I think is where the three second view measurement that they use probably came from. But that recall is, um, has a substantial lift if someone is actually viewing that content for 10 seconds. So if you can get someone to watch what you're doing for 10 seconds um, and make sure they know it's clearly from you, then that's a real win. Make sure you use oversized text. Make sure you're designing for mobile. I think that's one of the things that people forget. Um, remember, they're, they're looking at stuff on a really small screen. And test different durations. You know, while we sort of always encourage content to kind of be short, as short as possible, and for clients and brands to really only take the time they absolutely need to, to tell a story, um, you can test different durations because there are examples of content you know, that does work better that might be a bit longer. Um, it's just probably not, um, not as common uh, and Facebook have recently announced as well that they're no longer penalising longer videos. So in the past, they've um, given preferential treatment to videos that are shorter, probably in line with user behaviour. Um, but I think probably driven by their advertising model and wanting to actually um, insert ads in the middle of longer videos, they're now no longer penalising longer videos. So that's something to be aware of as well. Um, this is an example of some work we did with Gatorade um, recently. It was to launch a, a, a new product called Liquid Concentrate. Um, I've got these videos here, but I might, I might actually just keep going. I'll just give you a little um, overview of what they are. So the one on the left features Dan Hanabry, who's one of their talent. Um, it's only about seven seconds. It's, it's shot really you know, in a very mobile first fashion. It's quick cuts, it's fast. Um, we use oversized text to reinforce the points. The talent appears in the first three seconds. As I said, it's under 10 seconds and we've got you know, the Gatorade bottle or the blue or there's some element of branding in every single frame. And, and the research that came back um, at the end of this campaign noted that the, the content was actually really involving people, or involving for people, but equally important, it actually landed the product message, which is really the, the aim of the game. Uh, there was a, a kind of simple overhead how-to video shot with, you know, the, over, the overhead pan. It was really just telling you how to use the product. Um, just with a little bit of copy that created some interest and that did pretty well too. And then on Instagram specifically, um, a really striking visual that picked up on the blue um, and worked really nicely on the page. Uh, so customising for the channel. So be clear on the role of the channel first up. I mean, that, that's kind of 101, but it can sometimes be tempting to want to wanna be on you know, all channels. So make sure you understand why you're using it a channel. So for example, it might be you've selected YouTube because um, you know that people are going to be actively searching for information on how to use your product. You might select Instagram because you know that um, it's going to be an influencer-led campaign. Be clear on your advertising objective and then make sure that the placement that you've selected, particularly on Facebook, actually lines up with that objective. Um, know your audience, understand how they behave on social, 
understand the feed as much as you can. So it's quite hard to really get to the bottom of all the algorithmic changes that happen on the likes of Facebook. Um, but things like if, if you um, want to drive people to a website uh, and you're, you're running a post, people are clicking on the post, they're going to the website, they're getting there, they're not really engaged, they're not spending any time there and they're reverting back to Facebook pretty quickly, then that's the kind of thing where Facebook will recognise that and it will show you add to less people. So you really need to sort of understand the nuances of the feed as much as you can. Try different contents, different um, content types and formats. And I think that's one of the really exciting and also challenging things about social is the formats are always changing. So there's always opportunity to experiment and do new things. Um, and look for opportunities to be culturally relevant because that's a great way to, to be part of the conversation. Um, and as long as you do it in context of the channel that you're in, it, it can work really well. Um, this is an example of... Um, uh, essentially, we created a, recreated a little Snapchat lens. Um, it was done in the US. So Gator is a sponsor of the AFL. Um, Snapchat was a, a great channel to use because it really works well for events. It helped us generate reach super quickly. Um, it helped us gain traction with an audience that's typically quite hard to reach. Um, and it's just a very sort of high impact channel. It's not a channel that Gatorade needs to be in all the time, but it certainly um, worked well for, for this campaign and also for an event that has really a limited time span. I mean, you know, I think within 48 hours, people have moved on to the next thing. So being able to really um, maximise Gatorade's involvement on the day and, you know, really for the, for the 24 hours around the grand final um, worked really well. Uh, and then we used Instagram and, and Facebook differently. So we used Instagram and Facebook to drive awareness of what we were doing on Snapchat. Um, we used Instagram stories to capture some of the excitement and things that were going on around the live sites um, on the days prior. Uh, and then, of course, we captured you know, some of the really amazing moments that Gatorade was able to be part of, being down on the field, um, and we were able to share those uh, across the channels. Now, traditional media has is, is nearly always been bought primarily on reach, but for some reason that, that thinking hasn't always translated into social. But actually the real test of performance on social is your reach because to grow your brand, you need to engage with the maximum number of buyers you possibly can. So it's tempting to think about, oh, I just want to talk to my followers or fans because they're heavy users of my product or they're really engaged with what I'm doing. Um, you know, they're going to be more responsive to my content. They're going to share it. Uh, and, you know, but ultimately, um, most categories have um, a large number of light buyers, in other words, people who buy your product infrequently, and a very small number of heavy users or loyal users. So if you're not reaching those light buyers, then you're um, basically decreasing your chances of growing the brand. So for any brand, that path to growth is really to reach as many light buyers as possible. So you really need to think outside of your, um, your follower or fan base. Uh, and, you know, like shares and other forms of engagement, they're really just not meaningful um, metrics anymore. I mean, they might give you an indication of whether your content is resonating um, with your audience to a degree, and they might also help boost your reach in some cases or, or actually have the inverse effect, depending on the performance of the content. But ultimately, um, it needs to be about reach because uh, unless you're actually delivering a meaningful level of awareness, then you're not going to be effective. Um, so for this reason, I like to talk about fewer, bigger, better. So there's a, I think there's a temptation with social to feel like you need to feed the beast all the time and always be active and be always on and pumping out content. Um, but we're very focused on creating fewer high quality pieces of content, putting the right level of investment and resource behind them uh, and making sure the maximum number of people see them. It's kind of, it's kind of 101, but it's sort of, a, a, you know, it's not the way that we uh, and people have typically thought about social in the past. Um, social is really pay to play, so if you are publishing content on the likes of Facebook and Instagram now, you, you know, organic reach really doesn't exist anymore, so you need to be um, supporting your content with paid activity, subject to any further, uh, you know, bombshells from, from Facebook. Um, we like to work with a figure of um, sort of 30% for our kind of tier two content, so we're always trying to reach 30% of our target audience. Um, with our tier two content and when we're doing big campaigns, we're really aiming for about 45% because they're meaningful numbers. Now you might have a, a large audience and that might be you know, beyond the scope of your budget, but it's good to sort of set yourself a, a goal in terms of you know, the minimum number of people you wanna reach with your campaigns. Snapchat's quite an expensive channel to invest in um, from a paid point of view, 
although they are actually releasing a self-service model, just like Facebook did originally, so that might make it more accessible. It's also a channel that's very, very time intensive. And it's not for everybody, so I think you need to work carefully whether you want to invest in Snapchat. Um, Twitter, you know, is it very much a, a channel in decline. It's only really relevant for certain brands. Um, and certainly from an investment point of view, that's definitely the case. Uh, and obviously, you know, influencers provide, you know, lots of opportunity to extend your reach um, through a different way, of, a different type of paid media. Um, this is just an example of work we did across Facebook for a Pepsi Summer campaign, which is all about driving reach. Um, so on the end there, we created a series of little hacks that, that um, showed users how to get the most out of their summer. We, instead of just running the TVC in Facebook, we cut it up into smaller kind of boomerang style pieces which were more appropriate for the platform. There was influencer content that was um, uh, amplified on Facebook and then we also did some simple posts which were really just about telling people what was going on with the experiential activity that was part of the campaign. But the number one metric for this campaign was reach. It wasn't about really engagement. Um, we did take notes when a few people took umbrance with one of the, one of the hack posts, but generally it was really about you know, maximising reach over an important period for sales. Uh, and lastly, be responsive. So um, you know, I think in this, this era of the, the socially charged internet, you know, brands are often cognizant of the risks involved, but they're not always alert to the opportunities. And I thought this was actually a really good quote um, from the VP of Global Brand Strategy at Mondelez, which is obviously a huge global monolithic style company, but even they have recognised that they need to change the way of their way of working um, and change their structures internally so they can move more quickly when it comes to decision making and responding to opportunities uh, in the marketplace. Um, and I, I like these examples of responsiveness. So this one, I'm not sure if you saw this, but in December, Elon Musk um, was tweeted by a customer who was complaining about the battery um, charging stations and within immediately he responded saying yeah you're right this is an issue and within six days they'd actually changed their policy on this and I just thought that's a brilliant example of an organization that's really geared towards responding to um, you know the, the, these kinds of issues in a very um, immediate way. Uh, Air New Zealand and Qantas did something similar um, they uh, Air New Zealand challenged Qantas to a bet on Twitter um, during the World Cup finals, they found themselves kind of supporting opposing teams and it just unleashed a great storm of PR and positive goodwill for, for brands. And it's pretty impressive, a brand like Qantas, which I, I, you know, doesn't necessarily strike me as the most kind of um, a, a brand that moves super quickly, but they were able to sort of capitalise that on that pretty quickly. Lastly, I think you know, we've got to take a more agile approach to production. As I said, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be hi-fi. It can be a bit lo-fi. Um, and, and I think this is really important in social. So trying to apply those kind of very traditional models of production to social, it's just not necessary and it doesn't work. Um, the timetabling of it doesn't work and the cost of it doesn't work. So the economics of it just don't stack up. Um, so I thought I'd finish on a couple of videos because it's the end of the day. And um, I'll show this one. This is a video we produced for, for Mountain Dew, which is just an example of you know, a couple of guys in the office grabbing a camera, going outside in the afternoon, grabbing some extras. This guy actually here is nicknamed the Helvetica of casting in our agency because he always looks like that guy, so he appears in quite a few of our videos. <laughs> Just a fun little piece that picks up on the whole bottle flipping meme. Um, and lastly, um, so, so in summary, build salience at speed. So think about how you can deliver work that's emotionally impactful but also utilises your distinctive assets. Customise for the channel where possible. Think about reach as being a really primary driver and, and you know, have the structures and decision making processes in place so you can be responsive. Um, and I'll just finish on this little video, which is just an example of being responsive in a very everyday sense um, to the people that, uh, you know, often write into the Pepsi Facebook page. Pepsi, please reply. This has nothing to do with this meme, which is a nice blend of spicy, dank and creamy. I come to you seeking wisdom. This girl, she's very spicy and dank as well. But her and I have run into some troubles. How do I show her that she's the love of my life and that I'm willing to do anything to keep her?
Hi Franco, actions speak louder than words. Before you see your lady friend, pick up a can of Pepsi. Then offer it to her. Even if she turns it down, she'll appreciate the thought that went into the gesture. It shows you care. Let us know how you go. Good luck. <laughs> she said she likes Coca-Cola. She dumped me. My life's in shambles. Help me, Pepsi. Help me. Now she's with some new guy. She already moved on, some big shot doctor. Pepsi, please help me. You're the only one that can help me. Together we can destroy this Dr. Pepper. You're my only hope. We specialize in cola, not love, unfortunately. It's not about love anymore. It's about revenge. This time, it's personal. Revenge is best served with Pepsi. I feel like you wasted 20 seconds of my life that I won't ever get back. Thanks, Pepsi. Uh, all right, that's it. Thank you.